Have you ever asked yourself what goes under the hood when you drive a car around in your favorite game? How do game developers mimic the behavior of real world cars? Have you ever gone to a car dealership or showroom, picked up a brochure and seen the term turning radius in it and wondered what it actually meant? Or if you knew what it meant, what attributes of a car determine its value? Hello folks, my name is Aditya and welcome to lecture two on a series of lectures dedicated to understanding vehicle dynamics. We'll answer these questions and more in this video. Let's start this topic with a case study. Imagine you're an engineer in a large self-driving car company and you've been tasked with the following problem. You have to get your car following an other vehicle because your company has decided to add a platooning feature to your existing self-driving capabilities. Now, platooning is just a fancy word or in other words, jargon for a vehicle following model where a lead vehicle dictates the behavior of all the vehicles following it. So you would have a leader whose behavior the following vehicles attempt to mimic. Now, typically these platooning convoys are three to four vehicles long. Now, there are many reasons why someone would want to do this. For example, it reduces the drag experienced by the vehicles behind, so you save on fuel cost. Now, if you are a trucking company, Imagine, you can imagine that these savings can be quite substantial since trucks generally carry a lot of drag around. Also, with driver shortages increasing, you can eliminate the need for drivers in the following vehicles. As an engineer, you're probably curious to know the information available to you to solve the problem. You are told that you'll be given the position and velocity of the lead vehicle. So now you're probably thinking that you need to come up with brakes, throttle and steering wheel angles to get your vehicle following your lead vehicle or the leader. However, because you are an engineer at a large company, life is a little, little easier. You've been told that someone will take care of longitudinal controls. So what does that mean? It means you don't have to be concerned about manipulating brake and throttle to adjust the car's longitudinal speed. That is how far the car moves along the direction in which it's headed. Your job is to simply compute the steering wheel angle that needs to be applied at every instant in time. Now we have to control our follower. So we probably have to write some sort of controller for this. However, you're not too concerned because you're maybe good at controls and you have watched all of Brian Douglas's videos on YouTube. Saying that there is one thing that is not so clear to you. You're entirely, you're, you aren't entirely sure of how you would tell your controller about the system it has to control. For example, you as a human driver know that turning the vehicle left causes the vehicle to move left and turning the steering right causes it to move right and doing more of either will cause the vehicle to rotate or yaw more. But how do you convey this piece of information to a controller? Well, you could try talking to it. However, I'm not too sure how well that is going to turn out. Let me know if that ever works. Another way would be to feed this information in a mathematical manner using a mathematical model. Now, to me, that sounds a little more promising than the former approach. So let's go ahead with that. Now, how would you go about doing this? Because you want to keep things simple, you will probably ask yourself, what is the simplest way to model something moving? Then you'll probably remember the point mass model you learned in high school. So if I assume my car is a point mass and the other team tells me the car's longitudinal velocity, all I have to do is get it to rotate, right? So let me start writing down the equations of motion. So dx by dt, also denoted by x dot, is equal to v times cosine of phi which is the velocity of the point along the x direction. So similarly, dy by dt, also denoted by y dot, which is v times sine of phi, is the velocity of the point along the y direction. Now, let me write down the equation for your degree of freedom. Oh wait, but does a point mass carry a notion of rotation or orientation? It doesn't, right? So what do we do now? Okay. I know a rigid body has a notion of orientation. What is the simplest rigid body I can think of? 
Taking a step back, if I were to add another point and connect it to my current point, it should be, it should work because that's a rigid body and also it's the simplest one I can think of. So let me add another point and connect it, as I said. So I end up with this stick or line-like model that can now account for orientation or the rotation or the heading of my car. But am I fully done now? Probably not. I still need to make my controller aware of the effects the tire angle or the steering angle has on the vehicle. Okay, that probably means I need to add an element to represent my tire and it must move relative to my current stick model. So let me do just that. Now, this might look familiar to some of you. This is what we call the bicycle model. It's very much the quote unquote, hello world of vehicle dynamics. Strictly speaking, it's not even a dynamic model. It's entirely kinematics. That is, it does not involve or account for any of the forces or moments experienced by the vehicle. However, it does give us good insights into how a vehicle moves. This is exactly why many folks base their controllers on this relatively simple model. Now that we have a pictorial representation of the bicycle model, the next bit is naturally to derive equations of motion for it. Now, before we jump right in, let's take a quick detour to intuitively understand what an instantaneous center of rotation, commonly abbreviated as the ICR is. This is a prerequisite to understanding the kinematic bicycle model. Now, let's walk down our memory lanes. You're in school, life is all great, and you're in geometry class. Your teacher asks you to draw a circle. What do you do? You pull out your compass from your shiny geometry kit, dig the pointy end into the paper and swing it around. As you swing it around, the tip of your pencil rotates about the pointy edge. In other words, the pointy edge serves as the center of rotation for your pencil. Now, because your pencil is moving in a circle, the velocity vector denoted by a V with an arrow on top will always make a 90 degree angle with the radial vector. That is a vector that emanates from the center of rotation and points radially outwards. This is because the velocity will always be tangential to that circle at every point. Now let's make use of this information to figure out where a rigid body's instantaneous center of rotation will fall. Let's take two arbitrary points on our weirdly shaped rigid body here. The velocities at these two points, let's say are V1 and V2. Now, if we draw a line perpendicular to V1, we can say our instantaneous center of rotation lies somewhere along this dashed line. Similarly, if we draw a line perpendicular to V2, we can say our instantaneous center of rotation lies somewhere along this new dashed line. However, we need both those statements to be true. And the only point where this is the case is where those two lines intersect. And voila, we have our instantaneous center of rotation. Now, when I first learned about this topic, I couldn't wrap my mind around how every point on the rigid body could be described as rotating about this center. What if it's not just rotating? What if it's also translating? The key thing to remember here is that the center of rotation is just for that instant. It's instantaneous. The very next instant, this center of rotation might change. Okay, now that we hopefully understand what the instantaneous center of rotation is, we are fully equipped to understand the kinematic bicycle model. We will, however, not be deriving the equations of motion in this lecture. Here, we'll assume the equations are given and we'll dive deeper into what they tell us. If you would like to see the derivation, tune into the subsequent lecture, that is lecture three. Now, before we look at the equations, let's try to wrap our heads around the variables, parameters and inputs to this model. The instantaneous center of rotation, which we just learned about, is denoted by O in this diagram. It's the point about which the bicycle model is momentarily rotating. 
Delta is the steering angle and input to this model. So this is something we'd like our controller to tell us. Capital R is the radius of curvature of our center of mass. In other words, it's the distance of the center of mass from the instantaneous center of rotation. Capital R with a dash on top is the radius of curvature of the rear axle. It's the distance of the instantaneous center of rotation from the rear axle. V is the magnitude of velocity at the center of mass. This is what we would expect to receive from the longitudinal control steam. Beta is what we call as the body slip angle. It's the angle made by our velocity vector with the longitudinal axis of the bicycle model. Now, L subscript F is the distance of the front axle or wheel from the center of mass. Similarly, L subscript R is the distance of the rear axle or wheel from the center of mass. Psi is the heading angle and C of course is the center of mass itself. Now, after a bunch of derivation, we get these equations of motion. As I said, if you are interested in the derivation, do look at lecture three. Here we have beta expressed as a function of the steering angle and some dimensions of the vehicle. One thing to note is that beta in the real world is a function of a lot of other things. The reason we have such a nice and simplified formula is because the kinematic bicycle model assumes that wheels do not slip. We will learn more about what this exactly means when we talk about tires and the dynamic bicycle model in future lectures. Now, let's try to see what these equations are telling us. The first one is pretty straightforward. It tells us x dot is directly proportional to v, which makes sense. Because if you, are, if you increase longitudinal speed, going in the same direction, you would expect to cover more distance along the x-axis. And what is cosine of psi plus beta telling us? It's telling us that if our car's velocity is pointed more towards the y-axis, we will travel less distance along the x-axis. The second equation again is very similar to the first one. If you increase v, you would, go, you would expect to go further along y. And similarly, if our car's velocity is pointed more towards the y-axis, we will travel more distance along the y-axis. The third equation is the most interesting piece. We see psi dot is equal to v times cosine of beta times the tangent of steering angle divided by the wheelbase. The cosine of beta term can be a little confusing at first glance. It makes us think that psi dot is a function of beta and you probably start getting confused. However, if we combine the two terms, that is v and cosine of beta, that's just the longitudinal velocity of the vehicle. It's the velocity of the vehicle along the length of the car. So we see that if we increase the speed along the length of the car, we have a higher yaw rate. Another probably more intuitive way to think about it is to imagine, you, imagine yourself in a stopped car. No matter what steering angle you apply, your car is not going to change direction since your speed is zero. Let's look at the tan delta term. What happens if we plug in delta equals zero? Psi dot then becomes zero. This is exactly what we expect, right? If we don't apply a steering angle, your car shouldn't change its heading. If it does, you should probably get it looked at. Note that steer angles usually lie between zero and 30 degrees. And because tan is an increasing function in that interval, this equation also tells us that our car would have a higher yaw rate if we turn the steering wheel more. And last but not the least, we have our wheelbase in the denominator. So if we keep everything else constant, that is fix the longitudinal velocity, fix our steering angle, this equation tells us that a vehicle with a larger wheelbase will yaw less. In other words, it's harder for longer vehicles to yaw. This is, again, probably consistent with your intuition. Now that we know what the kinematic bicycle model is, let's go back to the question we started with. How do game developers mimic behaviors of vehicles? As you might have guessed, one way is to use the kinematic bicycle model with a few extra bells and whistles. Let's understand this a bit more. When you're playing the game, the throttle pedal or joystick gives you control over how fast the vehicle is accelerating. So usually, models used in games add velocity v 
as is stated in the plain Vanilla kinematic bicycle model we have here. It then consumes acceleration as input from you as the gamer in the form of joystick or throttle pedal position. Similarly, when you turn your steering wheel or press the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard, this is probably mapped to an interval between zero and delta max. And this delta max will be determined by the type of vehicle you choose in the game. Also, most games will have records of wheelbases for the vehicle models available in the game and will instantiate the models with the right wheelbases to correctly account for steering behavior. This might also be the case with longitudinal acceleration. For example, if you pick a Lamborghini, the game will probably set max acceleration to a large value. And if you pick a truck in the game, you would probably, the game would probably set it to a small value like two meters per second square. So what do we learn in this lecture? We understand what an instantaneous center of rotation is now. It's a point about which a rigid body rotates at a given instant in time. We went through many models and saw how the kinematic bicycle model was the simplest model we could come up with to account for steering effects. We looked at its equations of motion and understand what they tell us. With that, we come to the end of this lecture. Hopefully, you've learned something new. And as always, if you do like these videos, please like, subscribe, and share it with your peers. Thank you.